On behalf of Kerry Writers Museum and the Irish Arts Council, who are funding this program, I'm delighted to bring you the workshop on storytelling. So I've already told everybody that's come into our virtual room that we're uh, recording this. We're recording this for posterity. It's going to become part of the Kerry Writers Museum's COVID thumbprint on history. Isn't that magic? Just delighted with that, you know. And we've had a lovely little chat. I've been talking to Francis Kennedy, who's been a story hero of mine for 30 years. 30 years, Francis, how did that happen? Oh my God. So, um, and I want to, to explore today the resiliences of story, how story lend to our resilience as a people. So I was thinking, how would we do that? And I thought the first thing we do is we would look at the history of storytelling in Ireland. So back in the day, you can imagine the cottages weren't as weatherproof as they are today. The wind would be blowing in through the cracks in the wall, through where the windows and the wall met, through the little doors that sometimes weren't even attached to the cottage. They could lift them off and put them down on the ground and dance on them. And the reason for that was that it was a tax dodge. So we've been dodging tax for a long time. And there's a lot to learn um, for in our history about fairness, you know. And one of the things about the fairness was that if a storyteller came in, or a singer, or an entertainer of any other ilk, and they wanted to put their back to the fire and get a heat after coming in from the cold, then they had to earn it by putting a different kind of heat back into the room, by singing a song or telling a story. So woe betide the person that decided to go up next to the fire and did not have something to offer to the room. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that great, you know? So I find it, um, even though I'm, I'm doing Zoom since St. Patrick's Day, I find it very strange that I'm not hearing the comments coming back, but I'm loving the thumbs up and your, your nodding heads. That's lovely. So if you could keep that up, thanks, Claire. If you could keep that up, that would be amazing. So, um, so now we know one little tradition um, from Ireland to put order on a room when you'd be hearing stories. So let's look at how long story has been given resilience to mankind. Let's go back to the cradle of humanity. Let's go back 2000 years and societies have not built themselves yet. And people are wondering, how they can live cheek by jowl and how they can set up societies. So the Greek societies, one of the first of the, of the ones where we can look back in history and see what they've written down. How did they put uh, the idea of society into the minds and the hearts of people? They didn't have the written word yet. They had no rules yet. So stealing, for example, that hadn't been made into a rule. Giving taxes, for example, that had not been made a rule yet. Can you imagine it? Such a blank page of society. So what did they do? They marched through the streets with big edifices as heads towards the amphitheaters and some of those still exist today. And there they would put on little plays about if you're good, oh, you will go to heaven. And if you're bad, oh, you will be fed to the lions. So people got the idea fairly quickly that they better toe the line. So the first societies, the rules for those were laid down for us. Imagine that they were laid down to, for us through story. Now, once that became innate and became part of us, we still used story to hold wisdoms. And that's one of the things that I, I love nothing better than going into um, a community of our elders. If you call them old people, you do it at your peril. And I don't consider them like that at all. 
I consider them great fonts of wisdom. So I'm going to give you a little snippet of a story of when I was a drama therapy student. So I was studying for my MA in drama therapy and I was sent out to the Nari elders of Cork. And I knocked on the door and I opened it because I, the, the room was supposed to be mine. And there was a woman in there and she had a crossover penny. Remember those old, old aprons? And the flower was kind of up the front and she had the arms folded. And I said, hello, my name is Maria Gillen. The room is mine now. And she said, really? And I was like, oh my God, who is this woman? And I said, yeah, it's, it's booked from 10 o'clock. And she said, and who are you? And I thought I better give her my cock credentials. So I said, my name is Maria Gillen. I'm from Mayfield. And my mother was born in the shadow of Shandon and was reared in Grana Braher. And then she stepped aside and said, come on in girl, sure you're one of our own. And I got a scone and a cup of tea and I was totally accepted, you know, but don't come in the role of somebody who knows better. So when I went to the top of the room and the other people came in, I had learned from that experience. And I said, what are we going to do? And they said, are you, are you going to tell us why stories? And I said, no, I'm here to collect them. And that started the best 12 weeks of my life because the stories that they told me were absolutely amazing. And that's why I had to use two of these and less of that to collect the stories. And one of the stories they told me was about the blankets that had buttons because years ago there was no money for duvets and new curtains and changing your decor every second minute of the day. No, instead they used to use whatever they had to cover themselves at night. So old coats would be put on the beds and people would never talk about it, but they might mention the blankets with buttons. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful little snippet. Imagine how you could use that in a story. So that's a little bit of the history of story and resiliences. But now I want you to think, and if you have a notebook with you, to write down the questions that make you think. So this question is, what does story mean to me as a listener and as a teller? And they mean different things when you're listening than when you're telling. So I'll give you a moment to think. What do stories mean to me? What do they lend to my life? So we'll give that one minute and I time everything. Five, four, three, two, one. That minute, how long did it feel in your body and your bones? And in that minute, did you go into your internal world? Did you grant yourself the silence? And after that minute, I'll tell you some of the meanings of stories that I've collected in these workshops over COVID. Right now, Maria, it means community. 
This is my way of making contact with people. COVID storytelling is about making contact with people. Maria, it's a way that I can connect with my past, with my traditions, and I found myself getting prouder and prouder of them. It's a way of connecting with my past and representing where I came from. Isn't that lovely? Maria, it's a way of exploring the story. It's a way of changing endings and therefore changing the whole story of modernizing things, but learning from the past. I love that one. Isn't that great? Maria, it's a way of slowing down, of having a cup of tea, of grounding myself. I love listening to the podcasts of stories and they've become so rich in these last few months. Isn't that great? The archive of stories is building everywhere, all over YouTube, all over Spotify. You can find stories now. Maria, stories is a way of lifting my spirits. Nothing really changes when you listen to a story, but at the end of it, you feel better. I can't explain it. I love that one too. There's so many, and I'd love to hear yours. So maybe afterwards you can send me an email. I have an email address for almost everybody. I think there was a few sneaker inners at the end. Um, and if that's the case, if you could email us with your email details, I put together a little community after this and maybe we can get all of your ideas of stories too, but no pressure. Isn't that lovely? No pressure at all. Okay, so the next thing that I wanted to explore and it came up in those comments is the idea of catharsis. Again, this is not a new idea. This idea goes back thousands of years right back to the cradle of humanity. The Greeks coined the word catharsis. Catharsis means that you could have the worst day ever. You could be really busy in work. You could spill your coffee across your keyboard. You could have to have a tooth pulled tomorrow and be worried about it. But then, but then you watch something on television you connect with somebody that makes you laugh out loud. You're asked to suspend your belief for a minute, to believe that you're once upon a time in a different world. And at the end of it, nothing in fact or in logic has changed, but your attitude has changed and your spirits are lifted. That's catharsis. And stories and singing and set dancing and all the traditions can allow you to do this. In the scientific world these days, they talk about the release of endorphins. Promise you, storytellers have known this throughout history. They can raise your heart. They can make you think. They can make you laugh. They can make you cry. And all of this is connecting, connecting one human being with another. So that's catharsis. How can we explore catharsis for ourselves? Well, one of the things that I've been doing is I've been listening to a story podcast by Daniel Allison. He's a Scottish teller. And I listen to it in the evening if I'm worried. And after about two stories, I feel fine again. So that's the medicine of story catharsis for me. Also, when I go to the corporate environments and I'm working with people who are under a new pressure, who are busier than ever, we slow the pace, we set the scene, we tell stories, 
and people's feedback is that they feel better. I can't explain it either, but catharsis is a real byproduct of the medicine of storytelling. How can we use catharsis in the drama therapy model? Well, for that, I look at the six part story and thank God for Mooli Lahad. And there is a number of different models of the six part story, but his is my favorite. So if somebody comes to me with an unsurmountable problem, the first thing that we do is we put the problem aside and then I get a page and I make six parts, six parts in the page. And in the first part, and I invite you to do that now. So if you have a notebook and a pencil, make your page into six parts. And you, you don't have to do them as boring as that. You could do six parts in circles. You can do it any way you like. You know, but we make six parts and the first part, the first thing that I say to people, and I'm going to say to you now, let's, let's play as we go. So I'm going to say to you now, this has to be as far away from your real life experience as possible, completely the opposite. So you have to take yourself completely out of this story. So it has nothing to do with your triumphs or your issues or your stresses or your joys. It's completely outside of you. So give me a nod if you've got that one. Yeah, thanks Claire and thanks Eamon. These are the faces I can see. Okay, so now the next thing that you do is you take a, a lovely breath. And then you breathe all the way out. We forget to breathe all the way out. So breathe in again and all the way out until your lungs are empty and the space inside your head is as big as it can be. And in that space, allow a character to walk in. The first character, it doesn't matter who it is or what it is. It can be an animal. It can be the character that has never been seen in this world before. It can be someone from television or from a book. But whatever that character was, let it be the first one that came into your mind. When you have that character, freeze it. You have the power because it's inside your internal world. Then raise that character up into the middle of your internal eye so that they're floating kind of in space and frozen, frozen by you. Then walk up to that character, walk all the way around them. What are they wearing if they're wearing anything? Look at the feet, look at the legs, look at the upper part of your being. Then look into the eyes of your character. How are they feeling today? How do you know how they're feeling? By just looking at the frozen alignment that you have in front of you. What age are they? How do you know? How do you know by looking? Now, in the first part, of your story, just write one or two words or draw a symbol to represent your character. I'll give you a few seconds to do that, not quite a minute.
back. So the second part, as we put our character to one side for the moment, is an environment. Let it be the first environment that enters your imagination. It mightn't fit your character at all. That's okay. In this environment, allow yourself to experience it in a very sensorial way. What can you smell here? What's the temperature here? Are you inside or outside? How far can you see or how near is the distance to your eyes? What does it feel like under your feet? Is it rough or smooth or liquid? What is the environment like? So right now, in your second box, take a few seconds to write a word or two, no sentences, just a little word or two, or a symbol to let us see what this environment is like. And I'll give you a few seconds for that. Come back. So the third part of the six part story is the reason that your character is in this environment at this precise moment. Their raison d'etre in the story. It's where all the plot lines come from. Why is this character in this place at the moment? And you can endow them with a magic power or a special power to go with that. You don't have to, but you can if you want. So does your character have a magic power? And if they do, why are they in this environment today? What's their mission? What's their raison d'etre? Let it be the first thing that lands in your lovely creative heart and soul inside your internal world and i'll give you a few seconds to write a word or two or to symbolize that in your story right now Come back. <clears throat> so now we come to the fourth part of the story. And the fourth part is that something happens, something tough and hard to almost derail, but not quite destroy the mission of our main character. What is it? Who is it? Something has happened that almost puts a kibosh on the mission of our main character. So let that be the first thing that comes into your mind when you think about it. What could derail this character's mission? Now, in a few words or a symbol, write that down in the fourth part of your six part story. I'll give you a few seconds.
come back. So now we come to the fifth part. Someone, something, some act of God, some hand of a fairy comes to help, to help our main character, not to fix it, not to make it better because that's the role of our main character, but they lend a hand. They lend a hand to help. So what, who is your helping hand for your character? Let it be the first thing that comes into your head. You have a few seconds. Come back. The final part of the six part story is a big decision. It's the end. Is it going to be the end of a chapter or is it going to be the end with a big fine bow tied around it? It's up to you. You have to decide what is the ending of this story and is it, is it final or is it the end of a part of this story? How are you going to do it? How are you going to show us without saying the words, the end or the end of a chapter, that there is a cherry on top of this cake, that we are at the end of the story. It's up to you. I'm going to give you a few seconds. back okay so that is the first outline of a story let's look at where that can be used so i have used that story in nursery schools with children of course you'd say it differently you wouldn't be talking about the word characters because they would know what that was but if you said let's make a story who's in it it's amazing, amazing, amazing what children will tell you is in, um, is in their stories. And there's, they come so quickly because there's no barriers yet. And then if you say, where are these characters? You get the most magical places. And if the character is a meanie character and you say, well, that meanie character, would you live with them? They say, no. You say, well, where, where does this character live? and they give you all sorts of fantastic places. So I'll be telling a story tomorrow called Grumpy Gobs, and I made it with this mechanism with children who were between the ages of three and five. Three and five. And what an amazing story. It's one of my favorites to tell, and it's one of my most requested stories in my small e sessions here in Cork. So um, you can judge for yourself tomorrow. But that story was co-created with the hearts and minds and souls of three to five year olds. So one of the things that the six parts uh, mechanism does is it allows you to be fluidly intergenerational. It's absolutely amazing. I've also worked it with people who have dementia and it's amazing the things that they remember, the long term memory remains amazingly sharp and the stories that uh, come out of it are just beautiful heart stories so one of those stories um, included the the blanket without buttons they told me about the midwives 
that in the 1930s were no longer allowed to cut the cord, but for mothers who didn't have the shining shilling to give to the doctor, then the, the cord was cut anyway. You know, so I got amazing, beautiful, wise insights from this six part story with the elder population as well. And one of the um, how it could be used in a therapeutic and how it has been used in a therapeutic environment is to help people to say the unsayable. Um, one of the uh, things that I found out with working with suicide ideation and people who have been affected by suicide was that they like to look at golden moments. I would never have known that except for the six part story. And that looking at that was way more important than looking at trauma because looking at the trauma entrenches you in trauma, but looking at the golden moment moments allows you to see light at the end of this tunnel. You know, so the six part story has an awful lot of wisdoms to impart to us if we have the ability to observe and listen as well as make the stories. And how does it work for a storyteller? Well, there is a gentleman here, Eamon Keenan, and we worked a six part story and a story was born between us right in front of the two of us. And I will be telling that story in Meet the Teller. So that's the story of uh, the Anamkara, the cord between a woman and a fox and how she learned the thing that she learned needed to learn most through being able to commune with the fox. So that was a six part story um, that was, you know, a gift, you know, and I've told that story in so many different places and people come up to me afterwards and they say that story was meant for me and they have all different um, reasons why that story was meant for them. And I truly believe it was meant for them. It came through me you know, and through the mechanism of the six part story, but it's a medicine story and it belongs out in the world, you know, so I, I'm delighted with the gift of it coming through me. I was delighted with um, the community that allowed that to happen. So I was sitting in community with Eamon Keenan at a workshop at the time, you know, and um, so it has so many different levels of support, the birth of the story the giving of the story, the receiving of the story, the connection with the story, all of those things come through the six part story model. And that's only one of the tools of story making and story connecting. So I hope you've gotten the bones of a lovely story for yourself out of this. And I hope you got surprised. I hope you thought oh, that wasn't the character that I thought was coming into my head or what this environment is way different than this character would arrive in and the ability to play with all of that so on the subject of playing with that i would invite you to explore playback theater and a huge shout out to um my own playback theater in cork speak out so this is a way of connecting with heart stories so often we could take um, stories from people and then play with them through me the mechanism of rhythm and deep listening and then playing back their story. Um, so that I find is a huge compliment to the six part story. So that's a bit of research for you to do. That is a playback theatre that goes so well with the six part story. So I'm going to move on now um, from the six part story um, to the different environments that we tell stories and receive, receive stories in. In Ireland, we're very lucky because stories happen at our sessions. And this is where I met the like of Paddy Regan, who's part of the Kerry Writers Museum. This is where I met um, Liz Weir, who's become such a, an important influencer in my storytelling. Um, and I would have met Francis Kennedy 
in Milltown Malbec telling her stories. So we have it uh, in entertainment, but it's a really deep nourishment as well. And you can, you know, kind of they say an Irish wake is one of the best ways of uh, celebrating a life because you have the tears and you have the laughter and you have the memories of the golden moments and you have the prayers that this soul goes on to somewhere better and you have the hope that they stay connected to you. So all of that is part of the Irish wake, but it's also contained in the Irish session. And we're going to have a beautiful, we're going to have two beautiful sessions, one with um, our friends in Newfoundland, and that will be tonight. And the other one is going to be with the Listol um, Healing Hour people. And that's going to be absolutely amazing. I've attended a few when I've gone to the Listol Writers Week and the mix of talent and kindness and listening and attention that you get in, in that session is beyond compare. So I really hope you can make uh, both of those sessions and I hope down the road that you get to uh, Billy Keane's pub for a proper healing session. They call it the healing hour, but it's in Irish time because it never goes on for an hour. It goes on for five or six or seven hours, you know, um, and stories can be like that as well. So now I want you to ask yourself this question. How long have we been sitting listening to Maria? Then I'm going to tell you, it's been 46 minutes. And then I'm going to ask you, did it feel like 46 minutes? And when you're listening to stories, does something happen to the time? When you go to a session of stories for an hour, does it feel like an hour? Because in my experience, Time becomes an accordion for stories. It just shrinks. I can go to a storytelling session and stay in that session all day long and at the end of it feel rejuvenated and feel full of the joys of life. But if I'd gone to work for a day, if I'd been, you know, digging potatoes in the field, would I feel like that at the end of the day? So what happens to, to time when we're talking about stories? And a new phenomenon has started to happen in Ireland. They want to know how long does your story take before they'll allow you to tell a story? The old people would say, it takes as long as it takes. Or they'd ask you a question, how long is a piece of string? And those are the answers that I give when I'm telling a story at a session. How can you say to somebody, tell a story in seven minutes when that story might demand 15 minutes or 20 minutes, or maybe it could be told in three minutes. So the idea of performing stories is very different than the old fashioned idea of telling stories. So when you are working with your story making, don't put those restrictions on the people who are telling you stories because you'll shut them down or they'll try and get too much information in, in one. So before I leave the six part story, I have to tell you that in my innocence, in the early days, I'd say, well, we're going to do a workshop on the six part story and we're going to cover the whole thing and it will be out the gap by 11 o'clock and we'll be having a cup of tea. And then somebody would get into the character so deeply that we wouldn't be able to move on from that character. So I decided to respect the mechanism and we developed a mechanism, a 12 week mechanism of resilience, building resilience through the creative arts. 
and through the six-part story. And we played deeply with each section. So an example of that, an example of that would be before you even touch the character to see what characters touch you. So one of the things that I would work with when I'm working with young teachers or when I'm working even with school refusers, you know, or people who are deemed to be non-compliant in our society. When I work with those people, I say, can you think of somebody who inspires you? And saying it to you now in this room, can you think of a world leader that you'd like to follow right now? That's living in this time. That's actually doing a really great job leading us. And if you can, that's excellent. And I can't wait to hear who that is. And if you can't, who in history inspired you? And then think about why they inspired you. And then oftentimes I'd look at writing down every single quality they had that you admired. And then we might go through those qualities and take out the top three qualities that you feel you don't have and putting those three qualities as the qualities of the character in the first part of the six part story. So whoever your character is, they're going to have these three qualities. And then I might invite you to become that character, to try on these qualities. And in therapeutic terms, that's known as channeling. And in Grand Braher, that's known as common sense by common sense. Sure, if you've never done it yourself, you can try it out, you know. So they might say something like, oh, come here. When you're tackling that tax man, you just channel Father Murphy and how strict he is, you know. And in playing with those qualities, you might find that you have access to them. You might find you have access to them for the first time ever. I never forget the woman that came who was afraid to say no, who was afraid to take anybody on. And the qualities that she came up with was bravery and being sharp with words and not taking no for an answer. And over the course of the 12 weeks, this woman was encouraged to go into Dunn stores and buy something. It didn't matter what she was going to buy, she was going to return it. And so the next day she returned it and we were all at different little um, you know, rails of clothes watching her return this thing. And she wasn't to accept, you know, a, a credit note. And she wasn't to, to accept the fact that they couldn't change it. She was to get her money back. And she went up to the counter and she was trying to make herself bigger. And in a quiet voice first, she said, I'd like to return this, you know. And the person at the counter just kept doing what they were doing. They were, you know, busy doing whatever. And then she channeled her character and she said, excuse me, love. I have a life too. I'd like to exchange this and I want no nonsense. I want my money back. And the girl said, all right. And she took the item and she gave her her money back. And 12 people clapped from around. <laughs> done stores and we all celebrate it and it still touches me you know how effective it can be to channel a character and that is something that's really simple or might be really simple to you and me but something really big and life-changing to somebody who has never had the ability to say no so you can use this mechanism 
as deeply or as lightly as you want. I saw in the in Antrim how they use the second part, the environment, to make young people aware of the fact that they're caretakers for the environment around their school. And they came up with this idea of a mermaid that was in trouble. And what they did was they went out to the beach near their school and they looked at it through the eyes of this mermaid that might be trapped there by all of the rubbish that had been left there. And they just felt the impetus that they needed to clear this beach to make it accessible again for the mermaid, the mythical creature. And while they were doing that for the mermaid, the mythical creature, they were also making it safe for the other children and for the things of the sea that live on that beach. Well, now we've been together almost an hour. So I'm going to unmute everybody now and maybe just get a little bit of feedback. And if you could raise your hand, that would be great. And I remind you that this piece is being recorded. So it's the thumbprint for the Kerry Writers Museum the, the, and the COVID lockdown. So if you do uh, make a contribution, remember that it is being recorded. So I'm going to unmute everybody. How do I do that now? Mute all. Uh, allow participants to unmute themselves. Yes. So there you go. You have the ability now to unmute yourself. So I'm going to go into a different view where everybody is available. And um, if you can put up your hand, if you'd like to make a contribution, and then I'll come to you. So, Francis, are you putting up your hand? You're just unmuting yourself. <laughs> I was putting this in to gallery of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I won't put pressure on then. But is, is there any comment um, or any question? Absolutely amazing, Maria. Yeah. I couldn't get over how um, a story could just grow like that. Like, like you say, story seeds, um, do you know, the way you can put characters in any different environments and see how they go, like, brilliant. Oh, good. Yeah, you know. Thank you so much for the comment. And Michelle, so Michelle. Um, yes, Maria, just uh, totally agree there with Francis. And just think for writing in general, I thought it was brilliant, the six-part environment. I'm just writing a writing group, but I just thought that was amazing oh. just to try and get it to grow. Um, I loved all the, the whole idea about um, the inspiration of a character touching you, mm. you know, who, who you admire and how that can, you can feel it yourself and then you can, I just thought it was, it was amazing. I just want to say Francis loved you last night, Francis, on the Thank Rambling you. Yeah, story session. You were Love brilliant. You. you were brilliant. Thanks a million. Thanks, Thanks Maria. My heart. Yeah. Thanks a million. Okay. Any, any other comments or questions? Yeah, Claire. Maria, um, who was the person you said developed the six part story? His name is Mooli Lahad. So if you type M O O L I into, um, into Google um, and the six part story. So Mooli, six part, up he comes. And what I would do is go to Google Scholar because there's so much information on this story. You know, and um, he was one of the first responders after the tsunami. And he did the six part story with no language. So they did it through the body and through noise. And um, he had amazing results. And I often tell that story, the story of the, the tsunami um, when I'm, you know, kind of when I'm in universities or, and I'm showing the effect because the effect of the six part story to me feels miraculous, you know? So thanks for that question, Claire. Any other questions? No. Okay, so I'm going to mute everybody again. There we go. I'm just getting a handle on these things now at the moment. Okay, so um, My goodness. Sorry there, I'm I'm learning about uh, Zoom as I'm going along. 
So that um, is the six part story. So then I thought I'd look at the tools of the trade of a storyteller. So we have, um, you know, kind of, how do I put my story across? The first thing, and I learned this all those years ago from Francis Kennedy, is to enjoy the hell out of yourself. Because if you're enjoying yourself, everybody else will enjoy themselves as well. Another um, skill that I learned through observation of Francis Kennedy and uh, Paddy Regan back in the day was to involve your audience. And Francis is a master at this. You should see her up in uh, Milton Malve. So she might be telling a story and she'll put her hand on the shoulder of somebody in the audience and she'll go, isn't that right, Mary? Or isn't that right, Paddy? And they're nodding along and delighted to be part of the story, you know? Um, and Paddy Regan um, is a master at pulling people up and making them part of the story. So one that comes to mind is the story that he tells about the slow dance. And then he invites the lady up from the audience and he's doing the slow dance around the place and he's making it so real for all of us and touching our memories, you know. And some people are very at ease with pulling somebody up from the audience, but somebody else might not be like that, you know. So you need to find your own level and the tools that sit easy in your hand. Um, I really enjoyed uh, that looking at that through Francis's performances and through Paddy's performances and I incorporated it in my own and I loved it so much that I um, got into the playback theatre and you know told stories with six or seven other people so you're part of the telling instead of the person that's just telling so there's so many different ways of telling a story but enjoying yourself the pleasure of telling a story. It's really important to connect with that. And the minute you do, there's no going back. You know, so if you're technically excellent, but you're like, you know, oh my God, this is really hard. You know, the minute you make the switch into enjoying it, you'll never go back. You know, you'll never be nervous again or nervous to that same extent, you know. Um, so enjoying yourself rule number one and then that means that your audience can connect and enjoy the story with you instead of being afraid for you then you have the technical tools so the technical tools are pitch pace pause and what that can do is paint a canvas of passion isn't that lovely pitch pace pause and that can paint any picture you like including the picture of passion so how do i pitch my voice you know so a lot of public speakers these days you know uh, take the american model and it's very loud and it's very out there and it's very about the appearance you know and um, and also sometimes when you're pitching it to the last person in the room the whole time, then it lacks shade and shadow uh, of story. So think of it as painting something. So when you're pitching your voice, you can whisper and have everyone just hanging on every word. And then you can shout. And when you do that, you can frighten people out of their complacency. So it's good to use all of the pitches at your disposal because it's part of your art form. And then we come to pace. And what people don't realize is how effective the pregnant pause is. If you leave a pause, then it allows your audience to come halfway to meet you. It rubs out that line between you. And now, because of the seven minute rule and, and the fast pace of our modern life, everybody is trying to get as much information as possible into how they tell stories. And so the pause goes out the window because I really want to entertain you and just get all the information out. 
What a pity. I listened to a master teller of the medicinal tradition the other night in Tully Carnet in virtual Antrim. Her name was Dovey. She's a Native American teller. And how amazing she was. She was allowed a certain amount of time and most Irish tellers would have told four stories in that time. She told two. She painted so many beautiful pictures, vibrant in my mind's eye, that I can still tell you those stories almost word for word. Dovey set was for a whole hour, but it felt like 10 minutes. She was not afraid to pause, to look, to connect with the eyes, to allow what she was saying into our hearts. So pitch and the pause and the pace and the pace and the pause, they go together. If you're asking somebody to connect with you, forget about selling an idea or entertaining. Talk from your heart and you will find that that pace is a lot slower. So that's pitch, pace, pause, allowing you to connect with your passion. And your passion might be in that moment to entertain. It might be to touch someone's heart. It might may be to make somebody cry. But if you use your paintbrush well, and your paintbrush is made up of pitch, pace and pause, then you will find that the connection is easy. And then you will find you will be able to throw the paintbrush away because it's happening automatically. So in the beginning, you might practice in pieces your pitch, pace and pause, as I did when I was studying for my Lambda exams so many years ago. But then you will find it's like driving a car. When you first learn to drive, you're like, OK, I have to put the first gear in, I have to put my foot on this pedal, I have to check my mirror, and you're giving yourself instructions and almost translating for your body, telling it what it has to do. And then the day will come when you've driven all the way from Cork to Lishdol and you can't remember how you got there. So once you've mastered pitch, pace and pause, you should be able to throw the paintbrush away because the painting are making themselves. Does that make sense? Oh, lovely to see the nodding heads, even though we can't talk to one another, you know. Okay. So then uh, the next thing is to be at storytelling. So COVID happened and we all went, oh my God, it was the 13th of March and St. Patrick's Day was coming up. And I was on the phone to my friends in the Storytellers of Ireland and I was like, lads, we can't have Patrick's Day and not have stories. What are we going to do? Nobody had heard of Zoom. Nobody knew how we were going to connect. And then we reached out to all of the other communities and a Toastmaster stepped forward, Paul O'Mani. Paul O'Mani from Blarney Toastmasters. Thank you so much because he did so much for Irish storytelling in that moment. He took me on for 15 minutes and he showed me all of the tricks of the trade that I would need for Zoom storytelling to get the storytellers online on St. Patrick's Day. And then I put the word out and Liz Weir in particular really stepped up to the mark and she started telling other storytellers and people started making contact saying, I want to tell a story on St. Patrick's Day. I'll dial in, what do I have to do? And we had a session that was supposed to last for one hour and it went on for four and a half hours 
and in between we laughed out loud we connected with one another we talked about how covid was for us because this was all so new and a lot of people said it was the first time that they'd had contact with human beings in over a week imagine that and that was so many months ago at the end of that session we had four and a half hours of footage and we had to reach out again and we we talked to Max and Max was able to chop our little uh, stories into bite-sized pieces so that we could put them up on the Storytellers of Ireland YouTube page and I'd encourage you to go there because we had world-class storytellers telling stories on St. Patrick's Day and offering us their art form and what we didn't realise at, at that time was that we were capturing a moment in history and then we realised that we could stop and start the recording so by the time World Storytelling Day came we were able to do what we're doing now we were able to um, record the story the stories one at a time and put them up on the Storytellers of Ireland website and it spread it spread to the little clubs of Ireland and one of those clubs is the Cork Yarn Spinners and Lizzie who's a marketing professional she took over the mechanism with Anita Howard on this you know so we got a great thumbs up there from from Lizzie and because of that Lizzie is the engine behind uh, being able to connect these today so that's the story of how storytellers um, adapted and changed and got the stories up on a new platform and how through that platform we were able to reach out to a wider audience to the likes of um, Ken Parsons who came knocking on the Cork Yarn Spinner's door um, and and the um, St. John's of Canada storytellers. And now we're going to have a workshop together. Well, that would never have happened before. And now when COVID is over, we might be able to travel to one another's festivals. How amazing would that be? So look at the possibilities that are opening up and all of the other little communities that helped Toastmasters and Paul O'Mahony, Max, and his fantastic um, studio for uh, cutting the long four and a half hour footage into bite sized pieces. Lizzie taking her marketing training and applying it to this platform. Look at all the different elements that were behind the scenes helping stories to move forward because it is important to tell stories to tell our stories right now. So we've looked at learning from the past and the storytelling with elders. We've looked at connecting with storytellers in other places. We've looked at adapting and putting the finger on the pulse of the stories that are unfolding in front of our very eyes right now. So as a storyteller, I would say to you, go to the sessions. I've been to virtual London, virtual Canada, virtual states, all over Ireland, you know, and it's just amazing the stories that you can hear. And right now, in these moments, the storytellers are pulling together. There are storytellers that were on my wish list that I wanted to see and I would have to travel to festivals to see them and I would never see them under one roof. And during these past months, they have been contributors to some of the best sessions that I've been at and they've all been on the same screen. Make use of that. Sign up to all the lovely little storytelling sessions that are going on. I'm sure the Kerry Writers Museum will run one after this festival. And I know we have the um, Cork Yarn Spinners and they have a beautiful session once a month. You have the Tully Carnet Yarn Spinners and the Antrim um, uh, weekly session that goes on as well. Check them out, you know, and go to these and gather the stories and try out your own stories. 
It's like being in um, a safe place to tell stories right now because everybody wants you to do well. And there's amazing workshops going on. And there's people like the Irish Arts Council and the Armstrong um, Storytelling Trust that are financing these. So they're at your disposal. We want them to take off, you know, so make use of these. Okay, we're coming up now to 11.15. We've been together for an hour and a quarter at this stage. And we're going to take a break, a break for a cup of tea to gather ourselves. And then we're going to come back. So I'm going to stop the recording now for, for 15 minutes. And then we're going to have part two and we'll be finished at one o'clock. During your break, think about any questions you might have where you want a little bit more information or something wasn't quite clear or any feedback that you might have. And we start the next session by getting your feedback and letting other voices in because the other voices are really important. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm stopping the recording now.